and welcome to this year's ClinGen Clin Clinical Genomics Career Panel Series. My name is Molly Good, and I will be your moderator today. We have several genomics career panels this summer listed here, um, so please attend as many as you would like. Thank you to everyone who provided questions for our panelists during registration. If you have questions during the session, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and I can then pose your questions to the panel as we go on. As a bit of an icebreaker, we're going to ask two questions to find a bit more about our audience. So I will stop sharing and I will launch the first question. So the first question says, as of September, 2022, will you be a student? And for all of our audience members, please take a moment to fill that out. And then our second question is, how familiar are you with the genetic counseling profession? I'll give everyone a few moments. All right, it looks like we have mostly everyone, so I'll end the poll and share the results. So as you can see, we have a smattering of individuals, a lot of undergraduate students and people who are not currently students. And then we have a wide range of individuals that are with fam varying familiar familiarity of the genetic counseling profession. So anywhere from not very familiar to extremely familiar. All right, thank you all for participating. So before we turn it over to our panelists, um, we wanted to give a brief overview of genetic counseling since as you can see, we have a variety of individuals um, on the call today. And so genetic counseling is a communication process that aims to help people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. Genetic counselors are specialists who provide personalized information about your genetic health and have expertise in a variety of areas. Although everyone's path to becoming a genetic counselor is a little different, genetic counselors have typically obtained a bachelor's degree in biology, the social science, or related field, and then have completed a master's degree in genetic counseling from an accredited program. There are currently 57 accredited programs in the US and Canada. Um, finally, genetic counselors obtain ABGC and or CAGC certification after passing their boards. Genetic counselors can work in a variety of specialties and locations and can switch between specialties throughout their careers as shown here. And genetic counselor positions are continuously evolving. As you can see in 2012, 84% of genetic counselors positions were direct patient care. And now genetic counselors have mixed roles or non-direct patient care roles as well. Genetic counseling employment is expected to grow 29% through 2026 and the average salary for a full-time genetic counselor in 2019 was $94,900. Also, more than 87% of graduating GCs in 2016 and 2017 had accepted a position before graduation, and 92% of GCs report they're satisfied with their job. If you wanna learn more about genetic counseling, there are a few additional resources here on the screen. And now I would like to turn it over to our lovely panelists who have agreed to um, join us today. So if everyone would like to take a moment to introduce themselves, I will stop sharing. And if um, Alexis, you'd like to go first. Sure. Um, so my name is Alexis Morgan. I am a genetic counselor at Geisinger in the maternal fetal medicine, reproductive endocrinology, as well as with a research team, part of ClinGen and Genome Connect. Um, I got my master's in genetic counseling at Rutgers University and I graduated um, in 2021. Thank you. Sonal, if you'd like to go next. Sure. Um, so I'm Sonal Mahita. I'm one of the clinical genetic counselors in epilepsy and neurogenetics at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, I'm also the neuro GC program manager there. So we have um, seven genetic counselors who we manage. Um, I got my master's degree at the University of Maryland um, in 2014 and worked at Kennedy Krieger previously um, at, in Maryland before coming to Boston Children's, both in neurogenetics. 
Awesome. Thank you. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa. I'm a genetic counselor at the Rutgers Cancer Institute. Um, I actually graduated with Alexis from the Rutgers program um, in 2021 and um, just started as a cancer GC. Awesome. Thank you. Alexander, would you like to go? Sure. Uh, my name is Alexander Ng, and I am a primarily laboratory genetic counselor at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Um, I do have a small clinical role as well, so I fall into that mixed position. Um, prior to this, uh, I was at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and I went to the BU program, the Boston University program, and graduated in 2015. Awesome. Thank you. And Jason, it looks like you've joined us, so if you want to take a moment to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Carmichael. I'm the lead genetic counselor at Valley Children's Hospital in Madera, California, so we're in Central California. Uh, as far as my school experience, uh, I went to Brandeis University uh, for my master's program in genetic counseling, and my undergrad was at Florida Tech um, in Melbourne, Florida. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you being here today and for answering some questions. Um, I think we can start off with our first question being, how did you hear about your career? How did you hear about genetic counseling? And anyone can take the question or multiple people. Okay, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so I found out about genetic counseling a little earlier than um, a lot of people that I know, but it was in my sophomore year of high school. Um, we were kind of learning about different diseases and like different things like cleft palate, cleft lip, cleft palate, and my biology teacher at the time just kind of mentioned genetic counseling. Um, it sparked my interest because I'd always been interested in genetics um, since like freshman year. So about a year before that, I was interested in genetics, but really wanted something in patient care, not really research. I've been thinking about things. Um, so just kind of fell into it. Um, and my interest in neurology came from neuroscience classes and things like that, that we took during my undergrad career um, and shout out a couple of people in neurogenetics and, and really, really enjoyed it. So luckily ended up finding a position in the small little field of neurogenetics and have been in it for quite a long time now. Um, I can go next. So I actually found out about genetic counseling much later. Um, during undergrad, I thought that I wanted to finish school and get a PhD, become a PI and run a lab. Um, so I was a tech after graduation from undergrad. And I found that I wasn't um, sort of as happy as I thought I was going to be, and I missed talking to people. And it happened to be that there was a flyer for the genetic counseling program hanging in the hallway of our university medical center. So I actually just looked up what genetic counseling was based on that flyer, um, met with the program director and found that it was pretty much exactly what I was looking for in a career. So didn't know about it until after I graduated college. I had a similar story as yes, all. I actually learned about it in high school. Uh, my AP bio teacher was a genetic counselor before she went into teaching. So she would talk about, you know, some cases she saw here and there. So it was always in the back of my mind, but I was kind of set on being a doctor. And then I came to college. I did some more shadowing of doctors and realized, mm, I don't know if this is right for me. I don't know if this is what I want to do. Um, asked to see if I can shadow maybe some genetic counselors and fell in love with it. And that's how I got to the career. I first heard about genetic counseling in my sophomore year in undergrad, and it was a general genetics course. And one of the professors mentioned it as a profession and it stuck with me throughout undergrad. Um, initially, I thought about going into like forensics or law enforcement, but I did an internship with you know the medical examiner and I thought, nope, this is not going to be my career path. But um, but yeah, I really thought genetic counseling was a great fit because you get a chance to work with families and also you you really get in depth with genetics and and I felt like genetics moves so fast and it evolves. It's it's always been exciting. So, you know, once I heard about genetic counseling, I knew that was something I definitely wanted to do. And then I did not find out about genetic counseling until my sophomore year of undergraduate. I actually went to undergrad for pharmacy and decided partway through that I do not want to be a pharmacist. I like the genetics and the science piece 
that comes with some pharmacy, um, but was really missing out on more of the psychosocial aspect. So I um, have a, a personal relationship with somebody who went through genetic counseling, found out about it a little bit more that way, and um, just pursued shadowing from there and never looked back. Awesome, thank you all for sharing. Um, so we do have a follow-up question for you specifically. Um, how is neurogenetic counseling different from just ge the general field of genetic counseling? Yeah, so I can speak a little bit more, I think specifically to how, so I'm in pediatric neurogenetics, so how pediatric neurogenetics is different than general pediatrics um, for genetic counseling. So one big difference is um, pediatric genetic counselors in the general world will normally work with MD geneticists, whereas I work primarily with neurologists who aren't necessarily um, you know, board certified in genetics, but they have a specific interest in the genetics of neurology. Um, so we have very specific things that we see. So I see mostly kids who have either like findings on an MRI scan, um, seizures, or some type of significant developmental delay. So autism spectrum disorders, intellectual disability, developmental delays. Um, so the indications are a little different, but the clinics also work very differently. From my personal experience, um, pediatrics is very separate in terms of the MDs and the genetic counselors typically having really kind of distinct roles and not really meshing together for co-counseling and things like that. Um, might be different now because I did graduate you know, 10 years ago, so it might be different now, but that's really how it was um, when I was training. So that's one thing I really liked about neurology was I work with you know, a group of MDs and we really co-counsel because a lot of the stuff that patients will ask, I might not know directly an answer to, but the MD will. So we'll just have kind of like a tag team conversation about things. Um, I also do think there's a lot more independence in neurogenetic counseling because we really specialize and we really become the experts on one or two different indications within a group. Whereas with pediatric, general pediatrics, you really kind of get everything and anything. So it's um, more of kind of getting a lot of new things um, on a daily basis or things you might have to kind of, you know, that are out of your normal wheelhouse, but we really, really do specialize in a couple of different things for each of the genetic counselors, um, which I really like and I think is really interesting. Thank you so much for expanding. Um, some of you have already touched on this a little bit, um, but how did you all decide what school you wanted to go to for your genetic counseling program? And Melissa, we can start with you if that's okay. Yeah, um, so for me, I actually did my undergrad at Rutgers. I had met with the program director there while um, as an undergrad, just to learn more about the field um, and the program itself. But when I went to go apply, I kind of cast it over wider net. I was focused more on, you know, I wanted to stay in the Northeast. Um, things that were important to me was um, I wanted a diverse patient population because I knew I wanted to end up working in a place uh, that had a diverse patient population. So I was looking in areas for that and I wanted somewhere where they, I could really tell that I would be supportive, uh, supported um, in my training program. And then obviously last was finances. I did want to make sure I was close to home, but also that I wasn't going to break the bank while applying to schools. Um, so those were the big ones. And I think, you know, you don't really know where you're going to end up until you really go for your interviews and really get to meet the people. And I, I really just love the people at Rutgers and uh, was grateful to match there. Yeah, I can go next too. So one other factor that I had thought about when trying to pick a program was what I was personally interested in. So I sort of mentioned before, I felt very comfortable in a very like basic science um, sort of lab tech role position. Um, so I was really looking for programs that had an emphasis on a laboratory position. So many programs have their sort of highlight that they have as part of their program. So, you know, for me looking at the programs, I was most, assistant, most interested in finding ones that really um, had embraced the laboratory aspect at the time. They all do to a certain extent, um, but again, they all have their sort of specialties that they're proud of. Um, for me, uh, something that I really wanted was early clinical exposure. So I wanted to be able to get at least observing in clinics within my first semester at a, at a grad school. 
Um, I also wanted there to be a good relationship with the director and assistant director. So when I was interviewing at schools, I really kind of like what Melissa said, look to see where did I feel the most comfortable at? Who did I feel I was going to get the most support throughout grad school um, if I did feel I needed it? And um, really just kind of asking those questions to get a better understanding of what their door policy is, if it's an open door policy, things like that. And for me, um, one thing I loved about Brandeis was the location. So I, I'm originally from the East Coast, so families in New York and in Baltimore. So I wanted to stay on the East Coast for the places that, that I interviewed. And one thing I liked about the program, too, is that they emphasized on the, the family aspect of genetic counseling, meaning what happens when you know there is a child with a diagnosis, what happens at home. The director herself actually had a child with a genetic disorder, and that was part of the reason she started the program. So I really liked the history, and, and everyone was accessible. So I felt like the program director or the administration, they were always easy to talk to, the professors. So those were a lot of the different aspects, and you can even feel that during the, the interviews. So that's what really drew me to that program. Um, and similar to Alexis and Melissa, I was looking kind of for a good supportive environment, um, but also similar to Alexis, I really wanted something that was um, heavy on the clinical side. So I knew I was interested in the clinical side primarily. And so I really wanted a program that provided kind of you know, hands-on experience right from the beginning. Um, and I also knew I wanted to, or thought I wanted to do neurology. And so I wanted somewhere that had experience um, and availability of neurology rotation. So that's what went into mainly what went into my decision. Awesome. Thank you all. And we have another couple questions from the audience. So I'll pose another one. You guys are all kind of in different stages of your career. So I think that this would be a good question. But do you all feel that there is room to grow within your careers as genetic counselors or as your job now? Um, would anyone like to speak to that? I could start. Um, yeah, I definitely feel like there's room to grow where I am um, in my career. Starting out, you know, I just got to my one year mark. Um, but what I really also love about my job is that I'm I work very closely with the Rutgers program as well. So I, you know, looking at my career in the future, I hope to be an educator. So um, knowing that I get to supervise students and you know I get to be part of the application process um, is really great. Uh, so I definitely think that currently where I am, I'm growing a lot and cancer genetics is changing every day. So I'm learning new things every single day, so which is great. Yeah, I agree as well. Um, where I am, there's definitely room to grow as well. Um, I, neurogenetics is also changing, you know, I down a daily basis. So it's nice to be able to kind of learn as we go. Um, I'm much further out than Melissa. So I've, um, you know, since the beginning have, you know, been able to grow a lot between the two institutes I've been at, um, as far as like publications and things like that, or honing in on specific interests, um, you know, becoming a manager of some type of group that I was interested in. So the genetic counseling group, um, and I think that, you know, on a daily basis, monthly basis, we kind of reassess things if things aren't going well. So I'm very fortunate to be in the group that I'm in. So any opportunities that arise, we're usually kind of all the counselors are presented with, with those opportunities to kind of pick and choose what we want to do. I think I'll just add to that. I think it's really um, inherent to the profession overall, that genetics itself is changing so fast um, that the profession naturally changes with it. Um, so even though you start out doing one thing, there will be some new interesting crazy breakthrough that will require a whole new cohort of people to work on it, um, people to look at it, people to do research. So um, the profession overall, particularly with genetic counselors, I think just lends itself really well to really exponential growth and career opportunities. And and as far as the genetic counseling, and as he was talking about the evolution, one thing that's nice is that the skill sets that you learn as a genetic counselor, I feel like one major skill set is that we're involved with everything. So we're usually the go-to person, either in our hospitals, the laboratory, even when I call the lab, I'm looking for the genetic counselor because I know they'll have the answer for me. 
So having that skill set is nice because then you get involved with other things you didn't expect. So like for me, I've been in clinic for most of my career, but now here at the hospital, um, I'm taking on new roles with administration, with policy. And that's important because what's happening, especially here in the children's hospital is that genetics is not only in the genetics clinic or in the prenatal, but you know other departments, cardiology, neurology, even the laboratory, all throughout the hospital, everyone's um, using genetic testing. And so it's always important to, to really help those other departments because it's hard for them to keep up with it. So I do think as a profession, um, there's definitely growth within whatever institution or wherever you work. And even now genetic counselors are working in insurance companies, or I would like to see the next evolution of genetic counselors even getting into like politics or becoming politicians to help with, um, you know, with, with different policies for public health. <laughs> So, so it's definitely exciting. That's the one thing that kind of keeps me going. I probably, I'm probably the one who has the most experience of the group, but I'm, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I still love it every day. So. And genetic counselors can also grow within their, um, like their seniority at a place. So at Geisinger, we have GC1s, which is what I am right now. So you're starting off as you accumulate more responsibilities, sit on different committees, um, are involved in student leadership with thesis projects or things like that, you can advance to a GC2, 3, um, that more senior genetic counselor. So there are opportunities as well to advance your career with that as well. Awesome, thank you all. Um, so now I was wondering if you guys could each, knowing that no two days are the same because every day brings its own interesting twists and turns. Could you guys generally explain kind of maybe what a day to day or what a week looks like, especially with people with split roles? What does that split time look like? Um, and if Jason, you wouldn't mind starting us off? So, so usually my week, so I'm in a unique role because I, I do clinical practice, but then I'm also an administrator. So really when we think about a typical week, um, I spend about one to two days in our maternal fetal center. So I see prenatal patients. Typically the max that we see is five and those are five hour long um, consults. And for this week I'm on call. So if there's ever an add on patient, we probably get maybe two or three a week. Um, that potentially could happen. And these are patients that may have an ultrasound and then they're coming in. And then for the rest of the week, I probably spent about two days in our pediatric clinic. So I help with our metabolic clinic and then also working with the geneticists. And these are seeing children because um, at our hospital, we, we have the children's hospital, we have the pediatric clinic, but we also have a prenatal clinic within the children's hospital. So I would say roughly about three to four days of clinical work. And then on my admin time, I'm usually helping with um, setting up the genetic counseling schedules um, really supporting the genetic counselors if there's any any issues they may have and help with their development or onboarding new genetic counselors. And then we also have subspecialty clinics that we work with other specialists within the hospital. So that's a, a typical week. And, and one thing I feel like I do is really juggle the administrative and clinical part. Um, so every week's a little different, but, it, but it, it keeps me on my toes, I'll say that. And no two days are the same. Since I'm also in a prenatal space, I can kind of piggyback off of what Jason said. Um, so when I'm in my maternal fetal medicine time, it varies if I have a schedule template, I might already have six patients on my schedule and I might have a couple more add-ons that day versus I might just have two patients on my schedule. So it really does vary. Um, in my fertility time, I see patients who are trying to conceive um, maybe have had multiple pregnancy losses or are talking about doing in vitro fertilization and we can test embryos for chromosomes. Um, and then with my uh, research time, I spend a lot of time looking at genetic test reports that participants upload, taking important information out from those test reports and then submitting them to ClinVar, which is a public database for others to get that information as well. 
Um, and I'm a 60-40 split actually between clinical and research, um, but my research is also clinical. So it's um, I two days a week are generally research days, but it's managing two large registries. So one is for a specific gene. Um, so patients who have a diagnosis of KCNQ2 related disorders. And then the other one is kind of a national project. It's called the Brain Gene Registry, where um, I'm more of a lead kind of position that um, one of the lead sites. And so more managing like recruitment and managing the sites and kind of making sure everybody is doing what they're supposed to and recruiting participants. Um, so those are very meeting heavy days, just kind of research meetings, making sure everything's on track. And then I see patients um, primarily three days a week and two of those day days are just genetic counseling visits. So no MDs included just for test consent or some results returns, things like that. And then one of our days is our neurogenetics epilepsy genetics clinic, um, which typically anywhere from like one to three 90 minute slots where we'll either be going over really complex results or seeing new patients with the MDs to kind of assess for what testing to send. Um, so my weeks are generally actually templated pretty similar, um, but the meetings and things may vary. The patients may vary. I might need to add on a couple patients or if patients cancel, I get more research time or things like that. Um, but in general, it's not like um, Jason was saying where there's like on call or, you know, things might be added in. In general, it's kind of just templated and that's what I have every week pretty much. Yeah, um, I see patients usually three days a week, sometimes four days a week, um, about eight to 10 patients a week, depending on um, if I have add-ons or not. Um, and those other two days, I usually spend working on other tasks that I may have, uh, giving lots of talks to uh, high school students is currently part of what I do to talk about what is genetic counseling, um, focusing on, you know, supervising students and what that would look like, sometimes working on thesis projects also. Uh, so it's a mix of patient care and education for me. Um, and then for me, my role is very much different than the rest of the team on this call. So the majority of time, I'm actually looking at the um, genetic testing results that come off the sequencer in the lab. Um, and my role is really to look at them and, and interpret what they mean, basically, whether they cause disease or whether they're just, you know, benign changes that, you know, can do anything. Um, so really, my role is to look at those, interpret those variants um, and draft reports for um, our laboratory here in the hospital. I do see patients um, once a week, um, but it's really a focused clinic um, because so much of my other role is focused on that laboratory aspect. Um, so in addition to that, I also sort of sit on and do these other meetings, um, sorry, um, sort of related to um, helping figure out how to interpret and what sort of genes to put on testing panels. Um, it's something called ClinGen. So I, I participate on those meetings as well um, in my non-laboratory and clinic time. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, what do you like best about your career? And anyone can start. I can start. Um, so I really do like the aspect of what I call being a science interpreter. So breaking down complicated information for patients and families to understand so they feel like they do understand what's going on with the pregnancy or um, with creating those embryos and just really being that, um, that um, person who can help take that very complicated information and make sure that they do understand it so that they're making that informed decision for them and their families moving forward. And the genetics piece of it, it's always changing. So I love the fact that I am forever learning and trying to stay up to date with everything. kind of piggyback off that because the you know my my main reason of staying kind of satisfied in the field is that it is constantly changing and I think it's not something that we're ever going to know everything about and we always say with our families like we're learning with you kind of thing if we you know have a rare diagnosis that there's only one other child in the whole world that we know about you know we learn with the families and I think that's something that families appreciate us kind of being frank about, and they really do create a relationship with us that's different from any other medical professional where they're contacting me if they find out there's actually 30 other kids on a Facebook group or, you know, something like that. And then we're working together to kind of get all that information out there. 
Um, so I think the collaboration with families in pediatrics is really something that I really enjoy. Um, and I get to kind of be that go-to person, um, like Alexis said, as well as like, they typically don't go to the MD, they'll come to me for other things. And if I don't know the answer, I'll pull other people in, but it's really nice to just kind of have that really personal relationship with families. For me on the day-to-day, -day, I actually enjoy giving out results, whether positive or negative. Um, because I think either way, it has a, a very large impact on the patients, um, either that they're relieved to know that, you know, they don't have the hereditary cause that their family members may have, or that they're not going to pass something on to their kids. And, you know, if positive, it's also a relief for them to know that, okay, this wasn't, you know, there was a reason that this happened, they know why it happened. And, uh, and if they don't have a cancer, they now know what to do about it. Um, and so they don't have the same fate as their family. So I, I, I like that large impact that I can have. And then on the bigger scale of the career is that I like that I can always uh, mold my job and my career to be what I want it to be and what my interests lie in. So uh, if I am interested in policy in the future, I know that I have the skill sets already uh, to go into that. Um, so that's what I like about the career as, as a whole. Yeah, and I think building off what Melissa just said, I think one of my favorite things about this career is just how versatile you can be in your job, even just right off the bat. I mean, every single person on this panel has more than one role. Um, and at least, you know, throughout the different jobs that I've had, it's been actively encouraged you to sort of find what's interesting to you. And if you can make something of it in terms of your job, then you should do so. So there's really never a dull moment and you can, as Melissa said, shape how you want to go with your career. And one, one aspect that I really love about genetic counseling is that we, we have the opportunity to sit with families and really talk about their test results because, you know, a lot of times they either get referred from their primary care and they may get a quick five minute version of, of test results or positive ones. And so it's nice that we get a chance to really sit with the families and, and talk to them and go over it. And, and even, you know, where we work here in the Central Valley, probably about a third of our patients um, require interpreters. So the fact that we have an interpreter group who's really good and knows genetics. And so we really make sure that the families understand and, and value that, that interaction with the counselors. And like everyone said, I mean, it, it's evolving very fast. So I feel like every month there's something new, a new test, uh, new policies, things that come out. So I think with, with the field as a whole, I think as a whole, I think one thing that's really exciting is that it's always changing and we're growing with it. And you guys keep saying that the field is always changing and always growing, but where do you see the field going in the next five, 10 years? How do you see your jobs evolving in this next decade coming up? So I, I'd like to see genetic counselors like take on bigger roles in their institution. So I, and I've even noticed this that now even geneticists now are taking on roles where their administrators um, or part of hospital administration. Like um, at Geisinger, um, I, I actually was an intern with Dr. Ledbetter. Um, I don't know, yeah, he was actually a part of, he was the head of a lab at Emory and now he's an administrator at Geisinger. Um, so we're starting to see that more. So I'd like to see more genetic counselors taking on that roles because I think you know, it's hard for with administrations to really understand like how fast genetic testing changes. So it'd be nice to have our voice involved with, you know, change within the administration. And then again, like policy. So seeing more genetic counselors working with like a lot of um, public health initiatives like newborn screening, or even here in California, we have a screening program for pregnant women. Um, so yeah, so I'd like to see more genetic counselors get involved with that. And also just with you know, just working with the community, so more community initiatives, like where genetic counselors are more involved. I think building up what Jason said too, so genetic testing used to be a very esoteric area where very few specialties use it, but now you see multiple different, you know, divisions starting to introduce genetic testing into their workups. 
So I think there's definitely a role for genetic counselors to become even more specialized. So Sonal is mentioning how she works in neurology. So immunology, ophthalmology, these are all areas that really haven't had genetics touch their space yet. And it really is starting to be that case. The other thing too, is that the scale of genetic testing has increased so much. So when I was in school, we were really testing one gene at a time, maybe a few genes at a time. But now it's becoming more and more common to test everything. So your whole exome, your whole genome, and how you interpret those things are very, very different. Um, so it's come to you know need a skill to sift through all that data. Where do you even store that data? Um, so there's just lots of different arenas that really hadn't been thought of even just maybe five years ago in terms of where the profession was. And I think how we counsel is going to change. There are no, there are about over 5,000 genetic counselors and genetic testing is becoming more and more popular and uh, more accessible. So I think, you know, we're going to move into a field where not everyone gets pre-test counseling anymore. It's going to be a little bit different into group counseling or they're going to get some a video or something like that. And where our jobs are going to be a little more focused on the back end of giving out those positive results and doing more of that psychosocial counseling. Yeah, I agree with that as well. We've, uh, you know, started actually rolling out some pretest counseling videos um, at BCH because there's just too many patients who need baseline testing and not enough genetic counselors. And so we've tried, we're kind of trialing things like that. Um, I also think, you know, from a space of treatable genetic disorders or things that may make a difference in, you know, medication management, things like that, I think we're going to start moving more towards that in the newborn periods, especially for things like epilepsy, um, things where we know that treatment makes a difference. And I think it's going to be every child who has seizures right after they're born gets genetic testing somehow, and then they're able to pick a medication based on the specific genetic disorder if it's treatable versus just kind of throwing the kitchen sink at these little kids. Um, so I think that's also an area that I'm hoping will expand a bit, um, takes time, but I think that's where we're probably gonna you know, go with epilepsy plus or minus a lot of other things. And in the prenatal space, um, instead of just doing non-invasive screening for certain chromosome conditions, I think we're definitely getting to the point where eventually we'll be able to do that non-invasive testing for more than just a few different chromosome conditions to try and give families more information as early as we can in the pregnancy to help with any decision-making and preparation. Thank you all for sharing. You all have a lot of different roles. You all wear a lot of different hats in your positions. How do you take care of your mental health and prevent yourselves from getting drained and worn out and uh, burnt out in your positions? Um, so I can start. So I um, have recently started a supervisor role with more novice genetic counselors and have come across this a lot um, because I don't think we're taught how to do it. And so the first couple of years that you're in you know, your position, you want to take on everything, you want to do everything, and it tends to lead to burnout because there's just so much to do that it's impossible to not want to do a lot of, you know, that stuff. Um, I think the most important thing that I've learned is to really learn to separate, um, especially with these heavy things that we see on a daily basis is to separate that from your personal life. And, you know, I always say turning your email off when you get home, not answering phone calls, especially in this remote work world where we can access things 24 hours a day um, is the most important thing aside from finding things other than genetic counseling you like to do, but just kind of taking that space to just say it's four or it's five or it's six, whenever you stop working and having that line be there and say, I'm not going to look at my email. I'm not going to answer phone calls until the next morning when I have to start that, you know, hour of work. Um, and I think especially since the pandemic started, it's important to do that and it's harder to do that. Um, so that's the one thing that has really worked well for personally for self-care is just, you know, making that divide between work and home, no matter what position you're in or if you're remote or in person. Uh, and one of the first genetic counselors I've met that they actually were burnt out and they ended up leaving the profession. They said it's a great profession, but just beware of, of burnout because I, I think what happens is that everyone finds out your skill set and what you can do and what genetic, how genetic counselors are helpful. So you tend to get pulled in so many directions. And you're right. Um, so now it's hard in the beginning when you're first starting because you want you're eager to do everything 
but um but i think with the burnout too it's just recognizing it and so one thing that was nice at brandeis was that we had something called process group so they actually it was a class we had to take once a week we sit in a room our whole class with a psychologist and basically they would just say okay let's talk about you know what issues you're having like seeing patients did you have hard cases is there any group dynamic issues and the first year we really didn't want to be there we we're like ah, oh, this is boring and then the second year we really started utilizing it because we were actually seeing patients um, and we were able to talk through things so one thing i did here with our group is i brought that you know to our genetic counselors here so actually once a month we meet as a group and you know it's a safe space and we then talk about whatever we want um, we've gone to yoga classes together. We will go out to dinner. Um, so it just gives genetic counselors a space to actually vent to talk about these things. So I think that's been really helpful for us as a group. Yeah, echoing what Sonal said and uh, Jason about setting those boundaries, I think is very important. Making sure you turn those emails off, but then also finding a group of people you can talk to about those difficult cases and then not revolving your whole life around your career is also a good way to avoid burnout and compassion fatigue. I think another important thing is to remember what you like to do outside of work. So similar to what Sanal said, um, like for me, I really enjoy working out and playing volleyball. So I make sure that I do set time aside either before work or after work to do those things to help with any heavy cases that might still be weighing on my shoulders or just tell myself, this is my time. It's not time for work right now. Yeah, I'll just echo what everyone else said to you. I mean, it is important to have those work-life boundaries. I mean, to a certain extent, you're like, okay, if I just finish this one more patient or one more case, then I'll be done. But in the lab, the sequencers run 24 seven, but you can't do the same thing. So you have to stop at some point. Absolutely. So the next question is, were there any barriers you guys came across when pursuing your careers? Specifically, if there were any financial considerations with going to programs or Anything else? I know, Melissa, you kind of already touched on this. So if you wanted to expand more for anyone else wanted to talk about um, any barriers they encountered. Um, I think barriers were obviously the finances. Um, graduate school can be quite expensive. Um, and I was coming straight from undergrad. So I didn't have any job experience and I didn't have any money saved up. So I think I was looking at programs where I could either commute from home or um, they had scholarships available, or I knew that the program was very supportive of their students having part-time jobs um, was big for me. Uh, barriers, I think one of the most difficult barriers for genetic counseling is one, not a lot of people know about it, especially, uh, you know, minority groups where we're still working on that. We're trying to get individuals who are of underrepresented programs to know about this field and want to join this field. Um, but the other thing is getting that counseling experience. And so, and it's gotten even harder with COVID um, where a lot of hospitals are not allowing uh, students to come in. Uh, but I think one way to help get around that is just ask for a phone interview. Don't be afraid to send emails and, um, you know, just say, can I just, you know, take about 30 minutes to an hour of your time? Um, and can we talk on the phone about, you know, this career and what you love about it. One of the other things that I think about is genetic counseling. It's a very competitive program. Um, there are many people who apply and many people don't get in their first time. I did not get in my first time applying to grad school and I reached out to those programs that I did have interviews at asked how I can um, strengthen my application and my resume, and really then decided to pursue more of that genetic counseling assistant role, get more exposure to different um, advocacy groups, and try to get more shadowing experience as well to then go a second time and um, get into grad school. 
Yeah, I was going to say almost the same thing um, is the GCA roles that are now available are kind of breaking a lot of those barriers that I think were there before because you know, when I went straight out of undergrad as well, and GCA positions didn't even exist, um, like really, I hadn't even heard about them. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, like Alexis said, it's very competitive, you know, many people don't get in on the first round. And it's not that they're not qualified, it's that there's just so many candidates. So just one tiny little thing can put you a leg up above somebody else. And I think GCA positions in general are kind of that leg up. And so there's tons of positions available. And if um, people can utilize that, that kind of breaks a lot of the the barriers to knowledge and shadowing because then you have the ability to shadow anybody at that institute that you're at. You're already in a position you can shadow as often um, and as much as you'd like. So I think that really helps to break some of those barriers that a lot of people were facing previously. And I think it was, sorry, I think it was Melissa that mentioned it before. So, you know, genetic counseling is known more and more as a profession, but it's not nearly as known as, you know, doctor, nurse, physical therapist, something like that. So the double-edged sword of this is that while you can have a lot of flexibility, you can build your own role sort of once you get past graduate school, you do have to be very good at advocating for yourself and saying what you can do, what you can offer to the group um, because people just don't know about it at that time. So this role and this position really does require you to sort of have a voice in that aspect. Yeah, and and one thing too with with genetic counseling being not well known is that sometimes when you're pursuing it, even in your own family, and I feel like in minority communities too, like they're, they're like, oh well, this will be like a launching point to become a doctor or do something different, and so I, sometimes I feel like the profession doesn't get the same level of respect, even though it, I think it's a highly respectable position or or career to go into. So I think sometimes that's a barrier too, is like getting like that, that family support or community support to even go and pursue it. Um, but one major barrier too is the um, getting the rotations in to actually observe. And what I would tell everyone on, you know, who's listening today is just don't give up. Like, yeah, like Melissa said, try to get a phone interview. I think it's hard because genetic counselors are so busy and sometimes we'll forget, like, we were once in that position, like, to actually have someone shadow or observe. So, um, you know, keep trying, because um, I think, and it's not that it's, the, that they don't want to have you observe, it's just sometimes the schedule, they not allow them to, but I would just encourage everyone to keep trying on that aspect. And like Sonal said, the GCA positions are amazing because it really gives you a lot of the experience. And I think it does give people a leg up to even get into grad school. And what I've noticed is with GCAs, once they're in grad school, they're like way ahead of, you know, their, their classmates who are in GCAs. And then when they even start in the field, um, we have a GCA who started last year and she was really quick to onboard because she almost knew like most of the things that we needed to train her on. So I think, um, so I think those GCA positions are really valuable if you are able to, to get one of those positions. And they're, and they're posted now like on Indeed and LinkedIn, like their positions now that are posted at hospitals, labs, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah, and I will just say briefly that I currently am a genetic counseling assistant and I love my job. I get to do so many cool things. I get to do clinic things and research things. I get to work with patients and registries and do so many things. So I highly recommend if you're interested in genetics at all, even if you're not sure about genetic counseling, you get so much cool experience that can be applicable to basically anything in the healthcare field or the research space. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the position truly. So I think just being mindful of time, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so briefly, because we are having all of these panels about different careers in genetics and genomics, how does the role of a genetic counselor differ from other careers within the genetics field? So I think what's unique about our position is kind of something that Alexis mentioned before is that we're kind of those like medical and interpreters in a way. Um, it's like we really are unique in that we have the skill set to really take this complex information and break it down. Um, and I think that's something that's lacking in the medical field in general. And so we kind of fill that gap for genetics. Um, 
you know, geneticists don't necessarily have the time um, or the resources to sit down for an hour and a half with a family and go through every single detailed aspect of a genetic test report. Um, so I think it's unique in that we're more focused on kind of getting the family the information they need rather than like a diagnosis like right away or running different things like right away. Um, and we, we are kind of built in that way with our schedules and things to have more time with families. So I think that kind of translation process from the lab to the MD to the patient um, is really where we're in that middle kind of category where we get to go from the MD to the genetic counselor to the patient, which is unique, I feel like, then, you know, no other medical professional really does that um, in the way that we do or has the skills to kind of do it in the way that we do. Um, and I can go next here. So even though I mainly talk to providers, so I'm still doing genetic counseling, I'm translating that genetic testing report for the providers. And many times, you know, they're looking at the headline, is it positive, is it negative or inconclusive? So my role is still counseling those providers, it's just in a different fashion in that aspect. Um, so, you know, my role is most akin, well, you could be a lab director instead, but really my position is that connective tissue between the clinical side and the laboratory side. And we also have training on psychosocial counseling, where a lot of other providers might not have those dedicated classes every semester that help you build your psychosocial assessment skills um, to ask the right questions, to really um, pull out how a person's feeling about this information or a diagnosis and being able to provide them with the resources that they need. Awesome, thank you. And with our last question, is there anything that you wish that you knew before entering the field? Um, I can just briefly comment too. I mean, if you're thinking about in terms of at least of admissions, I mean, one of the most important things is really expressing that you do want to be a genetic counselor and the field is for you. Um, as was mentioned before, it is a fairly competitive process. So, um, you know, with such few slots available, it's really the people that really want this as their job and that are passionate about it and how it comes through on the application that will usually have the most success. And GC school itself really does prepare you for the field. So I feel like I really didn't have any surprises once I got to my role, aside from adapting to what each specific clinic might want. Yeah, so I think um, one side of the jobs that I've been in is kind of more administrative stuff that we have to do, like dealing with insurance and things like that. And I think something I didn't necessarily expect, I don't mind it now that I'm in the field, but I think I didn't expect um, a lot of kind of that aspect of things. So also just remembering that although you're a medical professional, you're an allied health professional, like every profession still has these kind of administrative things that we have to do. Um, I think that's something that I wish I had learned more about in grad school in terms of like how to deal with these different administrative aspects. Yeah, and I agree with Sonal as far as, you know, learning more about the administrative roles and then also just how to navigate within a hospital system, like how to work with other departments and how to advocate or self-advocate if you wanted to add on new roles or recruit more genetic counselors. So yeah, I think we don't really get taught that in grad school and it's, it's already a heavy curriculum. So maybe there isn't more time to include that, but I think it would be important as genetic counselors roles are growing like wherever they're working. Yeah, similar to that. While I do think that, you know, grad school definitely prepped me for what I was going to see in clinic. I wasn't prepped for all the administrative part and then how to, you know, ask for a raise or ask for um, a promotion, like that career development aspect um, is something that I wish I kind of knew how to navigate a little bit more. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining today and for answering all of our questions. Um, before we go, I just wanted to briefly show our schedule for the next month or so of all of our different panels. Um, there are lots of different individuals taking some time to talk about a variety of careers within the genetic space, so please feel free to join those. The recording of today's panel will be posted on the ClinGen website by Monday of next week. 
And if you want um, more announcements and things, you can follow us on Twitter. And um, if you wouldn't mind, at the completion of all of our panels, we're gonna be sending out a post-series survey. So please feel free to provide feedback for the future events. Um, and I just wanted to, again, thank you all for coming today and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.